Hello, and welcome to No Nonsense Nonprofits. I'm Sandy Ray, founder of Sandra E. Ray CPA, where we alleviate financial headaches so that you can create a bigger impact. We get lots of questions asking us how to set up our accounting system for nonprofits. And many of our clients are using QuickBooks Online. So we're going to be spending the next several weeks going over specifically how to set up QuickBooks Online in some very great detail. Today, we're going to give you an overview, but I want to let you know that these can apply to any other software that you're using. So let's just dive right in. So there's some things that you want to do when you're setting up any accounting system. And there are things that the accounting system is going to need for your particular accounting system, you're going to want to check. But for QuickBooks, you're going to need things like your legal name, your employment identification number, your address, and your contact details. And you're going to need that to set up the account in general. Then you're going to want to identify what your chart of accounts is going to look like, what assets, liabilities, net assets, income, expenses, other income, other expenses are we going to have. We have to think through how we're going to handle release of restrictions from restricted gifts. How are we going to handle restricted gifts and recording those as I recommend as customers, and then use the QuickBooks classes for our programs and our departments. That way we can get multiple reports out of there by program or by grant or using a combination of classes or customer reports and then filtering so we can get some really detailed information. You're going to want to know your primary accounting method. Are you a cash basis or accrual basis accounting method? And then, like I said, we're going to identify some very specific recording requirements. What do you need for fund accounting? What do you need for donor tracking? What do you need for grant management? Those are the kinds of things we're going to be looking at. For QuickBooks, I'm often asked, what's the appropriate version to consider for QuickBooks? For most nonprofits, that is going to be QuickBooks Plus. That gives us the 40 classes that we need, multiple customers, that kind of thing. If you find that you're going to be using more than 40 classes, you're going to have to move to QuickBooks Advanced. And you're going to want to know your start date for financial tracking. The nice thing about QuickBooks is you can integrate, say, your bank feeds. So you're going to want to know if you're bringing in some history, you're going to want to know what date you want to go back and bring in those financial transactions from your bank or any other integrated application so that we're not duplicating, but we are picking up all of the new stuff. And then we're going to configure your organizational things. And I'm going to share my screen here and I'm going to take you to the page in QuickBooks. I see that you can see that. Under the gear icon is the account settings. And we are in QuickBooks' sample company. So this is not a not-for-profit company, but it's the easiest way to share information publicly. You're going to need your company information. You can put your logo here so it can go on various different forms. And all these pencils are places to edit. You're going to select your tax form that you're going to be using. And for this version, oh, there it is, Nonprofit 990. And then you can even select your industry, contact information, your address, and communications, your marketing preferences with QuickBooks. After you get your company, you're going to see what your usage limits are. They've already have some accounts set up in here. Chart of accounts is limited to 250. The billable number of users for this version is five. And like I said, the classes are 40. If you're going to be using QuickBooks for invoicing, whether for programs or for pledge payments, you're going to want to turn on the sales. So you're going to turn on your preferences for the sales, whether you're going to have your preferred delivery method, service dates, discounts, deposits, 
Do they have to accept a quote? But just want to give you a heads up on tags. If you're not already a QuickBooks user who's using tags, tags are no longer going to be available to you. For invoicing, you're going to want to set up product service codes. These are codes that you can type into your invoice that tells you what income account to put the income that comes into your organization. Are you going to charge late fees? Do you going to allow for progress invoicing? Do you want messaging, reminders, online delivery, or statements? Some people get confused about statements. Statements is just a restatement of what's already been billed and paid and what the balance do from that customer, that member, that donor. You can reprint invoices or resend invoices, but the statement shows the activity on the account. So that's really nice. Our setup in expenses, we're going to do bills and expenses. Are you going to be turning on purchase orders or do you want to show tags? Again, that's if you're not using tags already, that's no longer going to be available to you. Do you want to be able to track items by customer? If you are have some grants, whether they're cost reimbursement or you have grant reports that you have to report back by a budget, you want this turned on. So make sure that is turned on because my recommendation is the grant is a customer. And so every transaction that comes through, you're going to tag it with that customer. And then we can run reports by customer and have your grant reports all ready for you. Again, are we going to be using purchase orders and what kind of messaging do you want on those? If you're using time and time tracking, we can turn that on here. And that is very helpful if you've got a team who you need to allocate their actual time worked to various programs. We can get that time tracking done. There's apps they can have on their phone or on their desktop in order to track their time. And then under advanced this is where we're setting up like our accounting stuff. What's our fiscal year? What is our accounting method? I love the closed books. Whether you turn it on or off, I would prefer that you have it on and you put a closing date in there. Say you just finished closing April. You have the option of allowing changes after viewing a warning or not allowing changes only if somebody's entered a password. The password keeps people from posting to your QuickBooks after a period's closed. The warning will allow the people to continue, but those integrations that we have, say from our donor management system or our credit card, those won't be able to post to a closed period. That's very important to understand. Of course, our company type, our chart of accounts, do you want numbering, categories? Are you tracking classes or locations? Obviously, those are two types of tags of information that we can use. I like to turn both of those on, depending upon how you're doing your setup. Are you doing projects? That's basically the same thing we're doing with customers as grants. What's your currency and some other preferences. So that's the basic setup in setting up QuickBooks in the settings section. I kind of want to talk a little bit about the chart of accounts. If you go to settings, you can. there's several ways to get to places. You go to chart of accounts. Now, depending on how you set things up, QuickBooks will make recommendations for a chart of accounts. So you can start like from day one with some chart of accounts, but you can go in here and you can add, you can remove. There are some accounts that QuickBooks will not allow you to remove. For example, retained earnings, the system uses that. Accounts receivable, accounts payable, the system uses that. So it won't allow you to actually delete them, but it will allow you to rename them. As you can see here, we have a checking and a savings account. And these little back and forth arrows let you know that those are accounts that are synced with the bank. So QuickBooks is going to the bank and pulling transactions in. Same with our credit card. And these are things that you can do to set up to make your accounting much easier. We want to make sure that in the income section, and it's not going to show very well here, that we're doing things like we have donations, grants, and program fees. In expenses, we're going to want program expenses, administrative expenses, but we can also handle those through classes. We may want to do things like program expenses and office supplies because programs may have both. 
But if we just do supplies and we're using classes for programs, we're using classes for administration and fundraising, we can have one supplies account and we can still get the information for the R990 and get that split across those program admin and fundraising. Our asset accounts, of course, you're going to want to have your cash accounts, your receivables. If you're accrual basis, you're going to have prepaids, our fixed assets. We're going to have our payables, our credit card payables, those kinds of things. And then because this is a for-profit, the equity section does list things as equity. For nonprofits, it's going to be our net assets, either net assets with or without donor restriction. I want to talk a little bit about classes. I'm going to turn the sharing off for a moment. The nice thing about classes, as we alluded to, is it allows us to track every transaction by a program. So we can have a class for programs, and then within there, we can have all of our programs. And like I said, we can have up to 40 classes. So a class with maybe two subclasses is considered three classes, just if you're keeping track. So those kinds of things, so we can have a program that may be supported by several grants. So we can run a program report and see the activity for all of the program, just not the grants that are in there. Vice versa, we may have a grant that supports several programs. We can run a grant report and have the classes all showing individually all the different programs and we can see that program and we can see how we spent the money. QuickBooks is not that great for donor tracking. You can do it, but it's not going to give you the bells and whistles that a donor management system is going to give you. And that's because you're going to have to really work hard to get those acknowledgement letters out. You're going to have to have systems outside of QuickBooks. But you can do it. You can track the gifts within QuickBooks. But all those acknowledgement letters and appeals and things like that will be done outside of QuickBooks. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll go ahead and have an outside donor management system. And we could potentially even integrate it with QuickBooks so that the donor management system is bringing in the gifts to QuickBooks. And that's the part that we need in the QuickBooks. We don't need all of the other donor tracking, number of engagements, those kinds of things. We just have that in QuickBooks. And we talked about grant tracking a bit. We've alluded to integrating the different applications. Number one, our banks and our credit cards. We can integrate our donor management systems. We can sync with online cash app, app programs like PayPal. So if you're using, those can be integrated it comes into QuickBooks in a landing spot, many of them, and you review it before it gets posted to your general ledger. Customizing special features. We want to make sure that when we are setting up our chart of accounts, we are categorizing things according to our statement of financial position, our statement of activities. We want to make sure we can do the statement of functional expenses, which is where the classes come in and maybe even donor reports. We want to create budgets. You can, within QuickBooks, create multiple budgets. You just have to be very careful on your report, which budget you're pulling. We can do a consolidated organizational report. We can do grant budgets. There's all kinds of budgets that we can put in there. By month, by quarter, we can have it spread evenly. We can import them. We can export them. QuickBooks is pretty good with helping us doing our budgeting. The nice thing about QuickBooks is you're going to also want to determine who's going to be using QuickBooks and what their roles are. So maybe we have a board member who's a read-only user. We are going to have a primary administrator, and that primary administrator is the one who's going to have those primary functions like creating the account, deleting the account, those kinds of things we only want one person to do. Only the primary user can transfer those roles to another primary user. And once you've done that, you're no longer the primary user. There's only one primary user. There's administrators who can do all kinds of things. You can segregate different responsibilities. So if you have accounts payable clerk, that person only has access to accounts payable stuff. If you have accounts receivable person, that person only has access to accounts receivable. 
we're also allowed to accounting firms. So you, a, an organization like mine can have a user access and I can allocate my one user license to maybe one or two people on my team. And that doesn't eat up your user license. So you generally have up to five with plus with QuickBooks Plus, you have up to five users and two accounting firms. So you might want to just give your audit firm access to QuickBooks so they can look and see how things were done or pull reports that they need to pull. Creating opening balances and historical data. This gets a little trickier if you're bringing things in from another accounting system or you're bringing it in from QuickBooks desktop. That's pretty easy. We want to be very careful to go through the checklist and make sure you're doing everything. Do your research because certain things don't come over necessarily. We've done some integrations with Sage 50 to QuickBooks Online, and there's some transactions that don't come over. You don't get all the historical data. So you want to, what comes over is batch information by month, by account. So you're going to want to pull some reports out of the old system so you retain that historical detail. And then, of course, you're going to want to verify that those transactions pulled over correctly. And then after you like looked at your old accounting system, if this is what you're doing, you're pulling in from an old accounting system, you're going to want to run that trial balance in the old system and the trial balance in QuickBooks and verify that they're the same. You're going to want to look at your receivables aging and your payables aging to make sure they're the same. Once you've done all these final checks, you can go live with QuickBooks. You can start using it. You can start using it from day one if you've got all this stuff done. You want to do a few tests. Make sure that your integrations are working. Record a test donation. Run a report. Process a vendor bill. Make sure things are working the way you expect. And if they aren't, you might want to do a little digging and figure out what's going on. Maybe there's a checkbox that's in the setup that you missed, something like that. You're going to want to create some recurring transactions. And for things that are going to recur on a regular basis for the same amount, the same vendor, the same customer, that kind of thing, those make life easier if you set them up to automatically. The same thing can be done for reports. You can schedule reports to be emailed out to you. Those, those automations make your life a little bit easier. They just show up in your inbox. You're going to want to make sure that it's backed up and you have the correct maintenance plan. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that's done because we've all had the instance where we've had a bad backup and we've had to rebuild from an older backup and it takes twice as long as it originally did to put the information in. I went very quickly, but I got through the list. I appreciate your patience. In the next few weeks, we're going to be going into some great detail on some of these items. So I'll be showing you more. I hope this was helpful for you today. And if you have any questions on this or other topics, please let us know in the comment section. Of course, we always appreciate your likes. I want to thank you for joining me today. And remember that creating a bigger impact starts with stopping the nonsense. If you're dealing with nonsense in your nonprofit organization, we'd love to help you cut through the noise.